bandwidth provided by Recursive Squirrel Interactive. Transcription services provided by TranscribeMe.com. Episode 535, 5G and Retail. Monday, March 11, 2019. It's time for this week's edition of the Beancast, a weekly discussion about the news and issues facing marketers today. I'm your host, Bob North. Thanks for joining us. We all know 5G's impact on marketing will be enormous. But have we fully considered the impact this will also have on already complicated relationships over consumer data? And does the build-out offer unexpected promotional opportunities? Tonight, we'll discuss. Also, the explosion of shoppable images, how retail is abandoning the innovation lab model, changing the conversation on ad fraud, plus this week's Ad Fail 5. That's the lineup. Let's meet tonight's panel. Thanks for joining us for this week's Beancast. I'm Bob Norp, and with me on the panel for this evening, we start with the planning director at North Carolina agency Mythic, Ms. Rachel Cobb. Hi, Rachel. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Now, next up, we welcome advertising consultant, author, freelance writer, Mr. Dan Goldgeier. Dan, welcome back. Thanks for having me back. It's always a pleasure to be here, Bob. And also with us, we have the VP of Product Design and an all-around amazing illustrationist, Ms. Jerlyn Thomas. Hi, Jerlyn. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me here. Uh, my pleasure. And finally, we, we're pleased to welcome back the co-host of Marketing Over Coffee and partner at Trust Insights, Mr. John J. Wall. John, how are you? Good, good. Glad to be back. Well, I had an eventful week, as the press has had an eventful week, dealing with mobile. I was at the Mobile Marketing Association's uh, Insight Conference, uh, Impact Conference, I should say. And uh, with both Mobile World Congress and the Mobile Marketing Association's conference in the news, 5G got a lot of attention. Uh, The hype machine envisioned a transformed marketing landscape that evolves the way in which brands can communicate with consumers at almost any stage of the purchase funnel. So, John, what aspects of 5G most excite you from a purely marketing perspective? What have you seen in the news? You know, the thing that is really getting me going is just so much more bandwidth for better quality video, and then that'll translate over into virtual reality or augmented reality stuff. So that's really what I've got my eye on and hopes to uh, that we kind of finally get to the promise of that. We've heard about it for a long time, but these laggy headsets and uh, just not having enough bandwidth to make it work have been a problem. But there's so much more to it than just 5G. I mean, the 5G, VR, as far as an opportunity, I mean, VR would be wonderful for a lot of applications, especially considering the fact that so many of these VR goggles use mobile devices in which to connect to begin with. Um, There's also the fact that just plain old video can be part of the experience in store at any given point, you know, you're, you're no longer having to dumb down the presentation for the device. Uh, you're able to deliver a much richer stream of data and a much richer type of content. Am I correct? Yeah. I mean, if, you know, the promise is there as soon as they get this network to where it needs to be. Yeah. Full screen video for everything is is definitely doable. You know, you're not going to have the throttle of the um, of the network holding you back. So now the question is, how fast can people you know make it real and get it into their apps? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dan, I, I know we were talking before the show a little bit about this and you said that you have been writing a lot about it um, or writing some on it. What, what would you say is your most exciting factor when you're talking about 5G? Well, I mean, it's exciting and it's scary. I mean, this is the minority report come to life. This is 
you know, the, we're talking about the enablement of very intrusive technology in many, many ways. And we're talking about cars that are going to track your, not only track your every move, but also react to what you're doing in your That's car. That's something and, that I don't think a lot of people consider. Yeah, I yeah. mean, people consider the mobile devices, but they're not considering the fact that cars are communicating all the time with central repositories and right. the ability to deliver information to the moving vehicle is enormous in terms of its mm-hmm. impact uh, in marketing terms. Yeah, and there's, you know, the wearables that uh, collect health data. You know, what – this is good. This goes a lot – I know there's a lot of very cool marketing opportunities that would happen, say, in-store. And, you know, but this goes a lot – this goes way beyond, you know, downloading video faster. I mean, you need mm-hmm. – you know, you need – you need a lot of infrastructure. You need a lot of um, back-end systems to work perfectly. And, you know, think about how wonky our current cell networks are. You know, I live in one of the most uh, technologically forward cities in the world, Seattle, and you go 20 minutes, you know, east of here and you can be in a dead zone. So there's a lot that we don't know. There's a lot of great potential, but there's also room for, um, you know, a lot of inequality in the system. That, that, that brings up two points. Uh, one is the, the build out of the system. I mean, mm-hmm. do we yeah, really? Weren't, go weren't ahead. curious about who builds this infra- infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, from yeah. a standpoint of infrastructure rollout, uh, everybody's always assumed that it's going to be a slow rollout from the carriers. And to a certain extent, that's true because you need to have some of these devices connected directly to the internet. Um, you know, hardlined into the into the internet in some fashion, but this is essentially a mesh network. And mm-hmm. as a mesh network, you can have what a hundred. I'm not sure what the uh, the exact um, specs are on this, but you need to have one device connected to the actual hardline internet, and then the rest of the devices, a hundred, a thousand, can possibly be meshed together. And you can put as many devices in that area as possible, but the phone company is not going to be responsible for that. That's going to yeah. be the building owners, right? The, right, the homeowners. Right. You don't. Right. You don't. You don't just need cell towers. You need data centers everywhere, mm-hmm. not remote server farms, but you need small ones that need to be located in places like closets in apartment buildings or in convenience stores, for example. There's going to be a massive need to, for space to contain these data centers, the energy to maintain power to those, and mm-hmm. they and they need to be secure. And if you're going to have a situation where each carrier like AT&T or Verizon or, or T-Mobile are building out their own networks, it's going to be a massive uh, need for space. It's going to be a massive need for a lot of infrastructure. It's, it's an opportunity as well as a, a, you know, a very, very messy rollout. Let's talk about the opportunities. I want to go to Rachel with this question because from a standpoint of dealing with brands and coming up with new strategies in which we can – deliver our brand experience out there in the world. Um, Does this pose an opportunity for, say, retail brands to potentially, uh, you know, enhance the experience at their store by building out their own 5G infrastructure throughout the entire retail location? Um, I think absolutely there's opportunity for pretty critical transformation to happen at the retail center. We see so much of it in the online people who are coming in to kind of overhaul how retail is done. So when we think about AR and VR and the ability to try things on from a dressing room and have it directly shipped to your home, all of those things will be happening in a way that that will be pretty critical. Mm -hmm. And for me, the thing that that most is exciting, the thing, John, that I get, you know, goosebumps over is the fact that this is one this is one connection to the internet, meaning you're not going to go and have to remember your Wi-Fi password at every single step uh, stage of your day. You're not going to have to have to remember the Starbucks password and, or, or the or, uh, Starbucks doesn't have a password. But, you know, <laughs> you know, it's just like you won't have to remember your work password. You won't have to remember your home password. It's one constant stream of Internet connectivity that is uh, delivered to every device. I mean, that presents me with lots of opportunities as a marketer to understand who the consumer is, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, there's a bunch of things that go along with that. So now you've got, you know, cable cutting continues to become a major deal. And I think that's why, uh, you know, all the cable providers are looking at 5G and trying to jump in on that. And then I'm also interested in the digital divide. You know, I can see easily in the big cities that's just spreading like wildfire. But what happens in more rural areas? I mean, it could right. go two ways. You know, mm-hmm. it could actually, you know, they could kind of be second 
class citizens as they are now, or you know more dynamic towns could set it up in town centers and at least get a you know a five or ten square mile radius of five G that's you know far beyond anything they've had before. Well, that brings that brings me back to the point I was making to Rachel. I mean, there there's a, a tremendous opportunity for say the local Walmart to build out their own five G infrastructure. With just you know, all you need is one AT and T tower that you're connected to, or one Verizon tower, and then the you know, set it up next to the Walmart, and then everything in the Walmart is just 5G enabled. So that you you add all that infrastructure in as a brand to say this is a service to our community. This is a way to get people into our store. This is a way to enhance our reputation as a brand here in this community. I mean, I think there's. There's tremendous opportunity for anybody going into into the retail space to, to build this out. But then it, it begs the question, though, I mean, Jerlyn, what do you think about us building out the infrastructure for the telecos? I mean, it seems like it's we're, we're doing their work. We're footing the bill. I mean, I guess we always foot the bill in the end, but we are footing the bill for the infrastructure <laughs> under this scenario. Yeah, correct. I Absolutely. So, Dan, any thoughts on that? I mean, it's just like, uh, you're, are we giving up too much of our power to the phone companies in this scenario? It's very likely we could be we could be doing that, and you know, I, I, like I said, I think there'll be some winners and some losers in the in the um, the carrier space as to who's who's out front and who gets in front of this. But you know, what you brought up about Walmart's a very interesting scenario. They can certainly become sort of the town center. If they are the sponsor, you know, in a lot of smaller communities, if they are the sponsor of 5G and if they bring sort of a connectivity or sort of a small local network into the area around their store, I think that's a really interesting uh, space for them to be in because, you know, well, it, helps, want, it helps because, everybody. I mean, it floats all boats. It helps all it helps the community. Yeah. It helps the customer and it helps Walmart themselves because it enables the 5G technology within their stores so that they right. can deliver live streaming video, live streaming VR experiences, AR experiences right in the locations. Yeah, they've got to see a return on it, but yes, it would be a very uh it would be very advantageous for them to do that, for sure. Bob, <laughs> grab your I... Amazon uh, shopping history as you go too. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what's interesting to Bob's earlier point about the marketing potential that comes when the um disjointed data becomes unified and what do we do with that? It'll be so interesting to see what level consumers will allow that data to be used in that way, given everything that's happened with Facebook in the last month. Well, that's what right. I wanted to talk to. I wanted to talk to you about that, Rachel, because um, you know something that came up at the conference that I was at when a five G expert was talking about the fact that up till now the app has been the central repository of data. And consider this. I mean, whether you have an uh, Internet of Things, where you're just talking about a home device, whether you're talking about the Wi-Fi router, or you're talking about um, the information on your computer, everything that you do online is essentially being handled by an app. And what we do mm -hmm. is we do they, we do deals for when we're talking about mobile data, whether we're talking about location or or personal data. We do deals with the with the individual app companies to get the SDK implemented into our device so that we can collect this data, you know, or collect this information and, and use it in our, in our marketing efforts. But now under this new scenario, this totally circumvents the app because all the data is essentially flowing through the phone company one way or another. So the phone company becomes essentially the repository of all information on the internet. It's no longer broken up between your your ISP and your app developer and your and your phone company and your home internet company and all these other different players in there. It's one player that controls our data. Does that scare you? Or as a marketer, do you think that it's eventually going to become almost like a a monopoly situation on data that's going to uh, eventually put the squeeze on individual ad tech companies and agencies and advertisers? I, I think as a marketer, it fascinates me, and as a consumer, it terrifies me. <laughs> um, I think what will be interesting to see, candidly, is is their ability to handle and, and translate all of that mass amount of data into something that people can use. Um, so I think that will be the real test of, of how can their models, as they've existed in the past, and their ability to change those quickly, keep pace with what, what truly they have at their availability. 
I, I see exactly what you mean. Um, John, I want to go with you on this one. Um, you know, I'm looking at what Rachel's saying, as a marketer, it's fascinating. You want to look at it as a consumer. It's terrifying because all this information is being put in one place. The, on the positive side of all the information in one place, uh, at least in this one guy's opinion, he was a guy from um, Ericsson, um, he, he was of the opinion that there's probably no safer place to put your data trust than the phone company compared to where it is now, which is at every little app vendor. Um, you know, does security improve under this scenario or does it just play a big old target on the phone companies is like, we just need to hack these three databases or these four databases. Yeah, no, you hit it right on the head there is, you know, it's yes, obviously they're going to have dedicated IT staff and it's going to be a lot tougher, but on the one side of it is, well, you crack one app, you get some data from that app, from that user. But if you crack that telco presence right there, now you've got all the data from everyone that, you know, now you've got a major breach. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think, you know, for some uh, apps, you wouldn't want their data to be centralized. You'd probably prefer it to stay somewhere else so that you don't have to deal with the responsibility of keeping that safe. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> I keep going back over and over again to something that Farah Bostic has said on the show many times, which is essentially, if you're not using the data, if it's not important to your business, for God's sake, don't collect the data. Because the more data you collect, the more of a target you paint on yourself, as opposed to just collecting the data you need. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many companies really need to collect my my phone number or my email address. I mean, it's just like some of them do, but most of them don't. They have no need for that information. And most of them certainly don't need my social security number. So when you're, no. when you're scooping up that much data, Jarlin, what does it do to you in terms of liability? I mean, it sounds like it's a crazy mm. move on their part. Yeah, I keep, I keep monitoring my, my security breaches on Pwned. <laughs> oh, yeah, Pwned. Yeah. That's a great, great opportunity to make sure that you have not been pwned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a fascinating topic and one that I'm sure we're going to cover many, many times in the future. But I want to move on to another facet of what 5G is helping to do and how it's kind of going to shape the way that we look at images online and how we shop for things. Um, the promise of 5G is helping to fuel the promise of social commerce. Now, the increasing ability to connect consumers with both peers and innovative experiences while shopping paired with the successes of platforms like Poshmark and Instagram are together inspiring players like Google and Pinterest to step up their game as they ramp up things like shoppable image programs and marrying it into social connections. All while many retailers are struggling with their own efforts to transform e-commerce into an S-commerce model. Rachel, first of all, do consumers really absolutely, absolutely positively need a relationship with the people they buy from online? Um, is this just a trend? Is it just a fad? Or is this something that we really need to pay attention to? And this is the way consumers are now moving. Yeah, this is such a great question. I mean, need is such a loaded word at a surface level. No, I don't think people absolutely need a relationship with people they buy from online, um, particularly when it comes to commodity purchases, right? I don't care who made my batteries off of Amazon. Um, I think particularly you know, that's online a, That's providers. a great point. Go that's ahead. a great point. What you're saying right there is like commodity products make zero sense from a social standpoint. You know, nobody wants to communicate with their toothpaste vendor, yeah. but everybody mm -hmm. wants to communicate with who they're buying their clothes from. <laughs> Absolutely. And I love the fact that I can see things online and um, that I can know whom in my social network have, has tried, you know, some new brand that I've never heard on and what their response was. And so it absolutely has the potential to, at the very least, break down some barriers that existed before, particularly when you think about categories that you can't touch or feel. And so you have to get past that. Mm -hmm. I do think, though, as you get beyond those commodity products and to things that, you know, require um, more or, excuse me, things that have more meaningful consequences. And, and by that, I don't just mean that they cost more. I mean, you know, um, are, are the consequences could be things like, is it safe for my kid? Will it look good on me? You know, mm -hmm. what if my online measurement for that custom suit is off? Those sorts of things require more trust. So I think it'll be interesting then to think about whether you need a relationship or not. How, what's the end benefit of having that? 
You know, the thing that bothers me about the whole social commerce debate, though, is, uh, you know, we keep holding up brands like Poshmark. And Poshmark is a peer-to-peer selling operation, essentially. It's a peer-to-peer selling operation. How is that in any way analogous to what, say, Target is doing or what Kohl's is doing? I mean, it's an entirely different purchase experience. Why does Target need to be more social and more peer-based social conversational, you know, than Poshmark? I mean, it doesn't seem like it's a reasonable choice. Jerlyn, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, like the the value in it, I I don't get from like a Target. I probably get like a smaller boutique kind of clothing store I would probably have a relationship with, like when my friends are shopping at, but not quite Target. I get it for Target when they do one of their special lines, right? When yes, whatever yes. designer is doing a new thing, I absolutely get the hype around that, the social story around that. And I absolutely understand bigger brands wanting to leverage a social conversation to be there. But do they do they need it? Do they need to make um, everything social commerce? Like the article I was reading today, or rather this week, um, just went, went off the deep end talking about how social commerce is where all consumers are wanting to move. They all want to have more of a relationship with the person that they buy from. And for me, that sounded like, well, that's not disrupting the way that we sell online. That's disrupting the way that commerce is done. I mean, it seems like we want to buy from individuals, not from companies. And how does a company even begin to compete with a consumer base that wants to buy from the individual that they know and trust as opposed to the big brand that they know and trust? Sure. I think that's a really valid question. I mean, I think there's this perception or misperce- misperception that a person is somehow more credible than a company. Um, mm. But I do think that you'll see um, a, a pendulum swing there, right? Just as in the brick and mortar space, when a pushy salesman crosses the line, I think consumers are going to smoke out some of these manufactured relationships that exist with influencers or chatbots, whoever they mm-hmm. may be. Um, and all that's becoming so pervasive online. So I think that part of it, Bob, is a fad that will fade because there's going to be a natural attrition as it becomes clear, there's no real relationship intent. Right. What about the the drive to create shoppable, shoppable images to make this is this has been a dream, Dan, of the advertising world for a long, oh, long yeah. time. How yeah. every image, every video can be somehow enabled to immediately deliver you a link to the product and give you opportunities to buy. Um, oh, yeah. How important mm-hmm. is that to the growth of social commerce, or is that something that could e- exist and grow and expand and thrive without any social connections at all? Well, I think it's a lot. I think it's very dependent on on, on social uh, networking because you know, when I think the the one that comes back to mind is back in the '90s. They say, "Well, why don't you just go buy?" If you watch the TV show Friends, go buy with a couch that's in Monica and Rachel's apartment. You know, you can buy that right. You know. There are people who just dreamt of doing things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that the social component comes in because people want to know, okay, is this something cool to buy? Is this something worth buying? Um, I think there's a lot of conversation, you know, the growth, when you look at say TV shows and, um, uh, you know, other content shows, you know, Right, online video of any kind. Online, mm-hmm. Yeah, online, online video of any kind, you know, it, it's a conversation piece now. We all talk about those things in our own, on our own time and on our own networks. And so, hey, did you see this episode of this last night? Well, I'd love to get what she was wearing or what he was wearing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so I think I think that that's where the social component of that comes in. Whether or not it's going to be a, a, a big driver of sales for retail, yeah, I can't speak to that. I don't know that it's... Um, I think it may just be more of a curiosity. It certainly makes the the steps between impulse and action that much, that many fewer. And so, oh, I like that thing. I want it. Mm-hmm. Click done. Yes, I see so much value in that because I have often tried to look for things similar to what my favorite star is, is wearing. So I, I do shop like that. Yeah, I think a lot of people shop like that, and I think mm-hmm. that the people have shopped like that for a long, long time. For me, mm-hmm. though, the question is: Is that something that um, how how does that play out in terms of the social commerce connection? I, I I see it working really well on social platforms. Like Poshmark is essentially a social platform. So, 
having images shoppable is like built into their DNA. And then you've got Pinterest, which is kind of a little bit further afield, more, much more a social platform, but they're also enabling shoppable images, you know. And then mm -hmm. you've got the the data search platform, Google, you know, which is really just about indexing the web. Um, you've got that doing shoppable images. And each of them is presenting this opportunity to connect with an image and buy the product that's in the image in an interesting way. But none of them are the same. There is no one social commerce connection to these, this content. It's all being implemented in different ways that brands can take advantage of. It's almost like the, the whole argument that every brand needs to have a social commerce platform is flawed from the beginning simply because every platform has different needs and there's going to be a growth of those opportunities in different, in different measure in different places around the internet. Am I, am I missing something here? No, I no, think that's, um, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and it just seems really strange that you'd think that Facebook would have been my first thought where something like this would have taken hold, you know, some kind of social shopping thing where you could meet with your friends and look at products and click through. So Instagram is doing shoppable image in a pretty, you know, seamless way. And I will tell you that the shift to shoppable images in Instagram from the like it to know it or some of these other third party apps you had to go through made mm -hmm. it that much more seamless a, a transaction. Yeah. And I think Pinterest is the same. I also think it'll be interesting as Zillow is moving into the home, you know, buying and selling market pretty aggressively. It'll be interesting to see how that becomes more automated or computer based. Well, that's that's really mm -hmm. fascinating and quite terrifying when we talk about real estate <laughs> getting involved with this as well. Well, I'm going to move on. I want to talk next about retail um, uh, in terms of the innovation lab model. The innovation lab model is what for years retail operations have completely depended upon in which to test out new opportunities and new technologies within their spaces. But now they're moving to in-store concepts. Now, I'm sorry, you know, if I can back up here. But now the retail is starting to adopt more of a startup approach of funding an MVP into market as quickly as possible. And when we talk about MVP, of course, we're talking about minimum viable product in case you mm -hmm. have been with your head under a rock for the last 20 years. So mm -hmm. um, killing failures as fast as they come out, making things elevated instantly and putting them in the market. Jarlyn, is this wise or is it just a trendy mistake? I am a huge proponent of agile thinking, and I think this is a great idea because it's like it's very flexible, it's simple, and you can test things really quickly, see if it's working. However, some disadvantage I might see, if you're not using the data correctly to fine-tune different aspects of it, it might fail. So if a product is working properly with a certain demographic, then keep at it. But if it's not, kill it completely, start over, see what's working. Right. Uh, it's basically the, the, the startup model, John, the one that we've all adopted, we've worked under. I know you've worked under it under previous lives that you've had in your career. I mean, you know, is an MVP approach the smartest thing that retail can do right now? Or is killing the innovation lab just a, uh, kind of a, 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 in the end, a mistake? But just because they could have kept the innovation lab open, it's just that from a cost, a cost standpoint, it made sense to get rid of the innovation lab, even though in the end you're losing that you know, R&D development opportunities that are always present in a lab-type environment. Yeah, well, I think a big part of the lab is when you, you know, kind of do UX, you know, user experience stuff, and you're watching what goes on with a customer literally over mm -hmm. their shoulder. If you're going to go to an MVP where it's just online and you're not able to get that kind of uh, human eye watching as you go, I mean, you can do some of that with some software like Lucky Orange or other things. But I don't mm -hmm. know. There's there's no substitute for actually you know, two-way mirror or having people on the floor to watch what's mm -hmm. going on and, and get you to some real – um, you know, actionable data. Uh, the concern is if you go minimal viable product after two or three times of getting burned on something that doesn't work right, do they just never come back again? Yeah, and for yeah. me, that's the the big concern. Do the brands, do the big retail brands have the appetite for failure that a, a startup environment might have the appetite for, or at least the drive to overcome? It seems to me, Dan, yeah. that you're going to have... Or probably, or probably the cost of it. Like, they probably can't afford mm -hmm. to 
to um, keep an innovation lab. Well, that's that's yeah. what I'm saying is it, it, the fact that they are cutting costs and saying we don't need an innovation lab. It's smarter to just go into market and do mm -hmm. the MVP model. Does that end up doing what John said it was going to do, which is basically uh, spoil the appetite for innovation at big brands when they have failure after failure instead mm -hmm. of giving them the opportunity to carefully test out new concepts in a lab type environment where they can yeah. get the best insights and understand what makes the best opportunity in market. Yeah, I think it's... Right. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. I was, I was just gonna, be... gonna say, I think there's an inherent intention between um, innovation and you know rapid progress and the land of ROI. And so I think that's where you know this these questions are driving. I don't know that either model is fundamentally right or wrong. I will say that probably the biggest problem I see with innovation labs as they have existed so far is the silos in which they operate. But yeah. it's been a tra it's yeah. been a tra it's been an opportunity on training wheels though because when you put it in a lab environment it's easy for the brand to say look at this cool stuff we're doing. Yeah, this might this might work, this won't work, but they they give themselves an opportunity to play around with innovative technologies and try new things without spoiling their brand in the market, without in any way harming their yeah. market share. Whereas when you're putting an MVP well, out there, it it, it it carries a lot of risk, and that's something that startups are incredibly willing to do because they're yeah. they're putting their all into this environment, they're putting their all into this effort. And they're going for broke, but the brand's yeah, not it's thinking that way. Go ahead, Dan. I'm oh, talking over say. you like crazy. <laughs> oh, it's okay. It's all right. It's uh, I've, it's been fascinating to watch it in Seattle, where Amazon has did a lot of different concepts in the real world before rolling them out to other cities. Mm -hmm. And you know, obviously, they have a boatload of money. They can set the pace, move fast, and others need to keep up. But they have a you know they've been testing this Amazon Go, which I know they've rolled out. Uh, to other cities, which is basically a convenience store that completely did away with the checkout counters. You just walk in, you grab what you want, and you leave. And there's an app that that tracks, you know, your every move and what you take and charges you after the fact. Um, so it, it, you know, and that was something that they tested out on their employees for a few months before they rolled it out into the public. And that's how they did uh, their. Innovate, you could call it an innovation lab if they're just testing it on their own people. But you know, to see it in the real world gives you a lot more information. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, in a lot of ways, this is exciting from a standpoint of the consumer, right, uh, Rachel? I mean, it's just like if you're if you see your your big box retailer suddenly experimenting with new kinds of opportunities for the customer to engage with the products in their store, engage with each other, um, get information, buy products. If, if you're seeing your store be that innovative, does that actually help in the effort of getting consumers to come in and try the products, try the information, try the, the experience, even if it ends up eventually being rolled back? Sure, particularly if I feel like they're doing it for the right reason or to further I know our relationship or my shopping experience. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And all the better if they're soliciting consumer feedback in the process. So yes, absolutely. You definitely need that customer feedback. Um, you know, I, uh, for over and over again, we see what happens with Google and Facebook and the big players whenever they change things or they, they kill things that people love. Like, I mean, we, we all, I don't know if anybody's a Hangout user, but the, what's going oh. on with Hangouts is like, it's killing my heart. It's killing my I know, heart big I time. I too. But so does it negatively impact a, a consumer experience if consumers find something very useful, they love it, and then suddenly the brand says, nope, that didn't work. We didn't make enough money off that. We're going to kill this. Um, what is the jeopardy of doing an MVP model when you're actually putting new things into market and expecting consumers to use it and then taking it away from them when not enough consumers use it. Well, that's life. <laughs> <laughs> it, things, it, go, it, things disappear. It, it's life and it's a reality. And I think as long as there's a bit of a story or an understanding of why and what's coming next, meaning there's a commitment to continue to iterate and evolve and, and make that shopping situation better for you, I think consumers are willing to to give give a little bit of leeway there. Well, um, up until now, the conversation surrounding ad fraud has centered on programmatic solutions fixing the problems in their own backyard. 
Um, but an article I read this past week suggested that maybe it's not a matter of better ad tech and laying it entirely on the technology's feet, but rather a cooperative effort between advertisers, agencies, publishers, platforms, everybody involved in the, in the marketplace to pursue fraudsters aggressively, essentially pursue organized crime organizations, because that's what it is, through good old-fashioned law enforcement. Dan... I, I love the spirit of this article, that somehow we're fighting each other. Advertisers are fighting technology companies and fighting their agencies and saying, you've got to do more to affect ad fraud, or impact ad fraud, when the real problem is the criminal element out there doing these mm -hmm. types of things. Do we need to just stop fighting amongst ourselves and refocus our efforts on these fraudsters who are in the marketplace and focus all our efforts on getting them arrested? Is that even a reasonable suggestion? I'm not going to hold my breath waiting for the Robert Mueller style investigation of ad fraud coming down the pike. <laughs> uh, you know, don't forget, if you're going to have investigations from law enforcement, okay, you need several things. You need a victim or several victims to come forward and inst instigate a complaint. You need a clear villain, which in some cases of ad fraud, we just don't know how it's happening or who it's who's doing the doing the uh, doing the fraud. And you need sort of a jurisdiction, which is in, 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 in which could be America, could be you know Europe, could be all around the world to to try this case. What brands? I've got some questions about this. What brands are going to step forward and demand an investigation and claim that they've been the victim of ad fraud? Who's going to be the whistleblower? <laughs> who is going to who is going to make themselves an enemy of the entire digital marketing ecosystem by saying all of this is a sham? I mean, we've seen a few brands like Procter and Gamble, P and G, you know, pull back their spending. They did that, I think, last year. But there are simply too many brands that are dependent on digital advertising to propose that there's some sort of, you know, a major investigation. And let's say everybody, let's take a break from from programmatic advertising until we figure out what's going on. Yeah, but are, we, are we really? Are they really suggesting that though, Dan? I mean, are they really suggesting that we pull back from all digital advertising until we get our house in order? Well, no. or are we? We're just talking I mean, about. Yeah, no one's no one's going to say no one's going to say let's just stop this completely. But but, are, but are if you? You're, but if you're going to have several brands, somebody's got to say, well, we're getting scammed out of a couple of billion dollars, and we're not going to take it anymore. Are you, yeah. are you, yeah, are you suggesting though that um, so one of the reasons that no brand or, or no um, advertiser out there wants to take a stand is because they make themselves essentially a target for fraud? I mean, is this like a, a potential hacking? I mean, it's like, or is this more about nobody they wants make to admit a that? Bad guy. But they do, uh, uh, essentially, you're saying that they don't still want to seem like they're they're pointing a finger at the fraud in the industry or admitting that they've been a victim of fraud. Uh, I'm trying to get a handle on what exactly you're saying. No, that's okay. They're, they're good. They've got to be willing to rock the boat. They've got to be willing to say, this is rampant, this ad fraud. You know, our friend Bob Hoffman loves to harp on this week after week after week that it's billions of dollars of fraud. Well, there's got and there's got to be major players that are involved in it. Well, and somebody, oh, go ahead. I think that's such a good point about the whistleblower, Dan, because what CMO whose tenure at what at this point is up to 43 months is going to go out there and say, hey, guys, we wasted X percent of our digital budget this year on fraudulent ads. Oh. So while I mean, I, I totally believe that finger pointing one side to the other isn't going to help. Right. No one side of the conversation can mitigate, much less solve it. I, I don't know how you begin to create the movement that that. Um, is required to get the entire body aligned on how we fight this thing. And I love what Dan pointed out too, Rachel, when he was saying that the, the, there's a jurisdiction issue. Like, who? How do you go after ad fraud when it's an international crime at this point? You know, it's not just contained in the U.S. I mean, it's something that, I mean, we, as we know many times over over the last few years, according to the news. So much of the fraud that's going on out there is coming from offshore enterprises. And these are criminal organizations that are international in scope. How do you even begin to pursue it? It seems like it's a, it's a complete waste of time to even pursue any of the fraud from that standpoint. And it really does fall down to the tech actually improving itself and circumventing these fraud opportunities. 
Uh, I guess I left it open. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that and then, you know, as long as there's some success to show, then you just kind of write off everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Th think about think about 10 years ago, mortgage fraud, you know, and all the stuff in the housing market that brought down the economy. How many people went to jail after that? How many companies got fined a handful, but not a lot? And it just started up right again. You know, now you're going to get a, even a more esoteric subject like ad fraud that most people don't even understand how it's happening. They don't understand the mechanisms that it's occurring. How, how, who's going to figure this out? Mm -hmm. John, I don't know. John, I'd love to get your opinions on this. Uh, obviously, with your many years doing marketing over coffee and actually talking about this problem and about the ad fraud issue over and over again, um, what, what is the answer in your opinion? I mean, do we need to actually improve the technology? Is that where the focus needs to remain? Or is it more about law enforcement and no matter how hard it is, we need to be, be aggressively pursuing criminal enterprises a lot more intentionally? Yeah, I don't I have a hard time seeing companies jump on, you know, the legal system and and hoping that they can kind of catch up and understand what's going on. The the only thing that we've seen that has been really successful is, you know, diving in and really analyzing your results because usually ad fraud is pretty obvious to spot, you know, when you're seeing thousands of clicks from some countries that you've never sold anything to, mm -hmm. you know, ever. Um, and then just being able to put some heat on who whoever you're buying from to say, look, you know, we found these things wrong, you need to make good and give us something else or, or redirect entirely to different platforms or um, organizations. But yeah, that's you know, so really... So let, let, me, let me clarify then. Do, do, are you suggesting that we need better monitoring of our, of our clicks and we need better monitoring tools and we need to be taking personal responsibility for our ad inventory? Or are you saying that the technology could be improved and that at the platform level, at the ad serving level, we need to be doing better in that area and putting our focus on improving the, the safeguards against ad fraud there. And, you know, both would be great solutions. I think, you know, you can't have into, both. You know that. <laughs> well, yeah, right. That's, well, you know, it's the problem is it's tough for the advertiser themselves to do it because now you have to basically have data science, you know, technology and talent in house, which is an extremely high ask. Right. And you may hit a point where you say it's just, you know, easier to flush half the money and say it's gone. And mm -hmm. then, yeah, I don't know, asking the, the tool providers and the networks to, to kind of extinguish their own income, you'd have to come up with some kind of different model for your fees, you know, to make kind of doing your own bloodletting worthwhile. But I think we just found our new business model because if we could create that AI to help to assist us as advertisers with that monitoring and that reporting and to go out and crawl the most popular platforms and publishers to begin to identify it more, right? Then you get a supply and demand model where mm -hmm. everyone's going to move to the person who can prove the lowest rate of fraud and the others will have to get on board mm -hmm. and find a way to, to curb it. I'm not sure if I'd call that a business opportunity or a pipe dream. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the best business opportunities were pipe dreams. I we agree. just need an MVP. That's all we need. Yeah. <laughs> get that MVP out the market right away. Right. Well, with that, it's time for the Ad Fail 5. But before we get to that segment of the show, I do want to take this quick opportunity to thank my guests again and allow them to each do a shameless plug Starting with Rachel Cobb, you can find her at bmythic.com. That's the home of Mythic, the agency where she is planning director. Tell us what's going on in your world, Rachel. What would you like to promote? Oh, man, we've got so much going on right now. It's We've really spent a lot of time in the past year working in the B2B space and places that are pretty, you know, actually exciting and entertaining given the reputation that B2B has had in the past. Fantastic. That's awesome. And so if anybody wants to check out what... Rachel and the team there at Mythic is working on. You can go to bemythic.com. Next up, we have Dan Goldgeier. You can find him at dangoldgeier.com. That's the central repository for everything from how to consult with Dan to how to buy his books. And I'm sure he'll tell you everything <laughs> about that real, real quick. Uh, also, mm -hmm. just quick note, he, he does, uh, you still write for Ad Pulp, right? Every now and then, yes, I write for Ad Pulp, still write for Talent Zoo. Uh, a column about advertising every few weeks or so. And you can also uh, go on to um, Amazon and buy my book, Killer Executions and Scrubbed Decks, an outside-the-box look at advertising, uh, at obnoxious advertising and marketing jargon, all the words that we love to use and love to hate. Mm -hmm. It's available at Amazon. And thank you for your support. 
You also got the Cheap Seats book. Don't forget about your other book. Oh, yeah. You, uh, don't don't throw the other baby out. <laughs> yeah, from the Cheap Seats, um, uh, a closer look at a lot of uh, idiosyncrasies of the ad business, and that's also available on Amazon. Fantastic. Yeah, definitely read Dan's books. Uh, and work with Dan, great writer. Um, That's even better idea. <laughs> that is an even better <laughs> idea. More than my books. Now, Jerlyn Thomas, you can find her at jerlynthomas.com. That's right now filled up with a lot of her amazing paintings and illustrations. She does some fantastic work. She's also a fantastic um, art director, designer. I mean, I'm not sure how to describe all the many <laughs> things that you do. And I know we're not allowed to talk about where you work, but <laughs> tell us what's going on in your world. What would you like to promote? Well, I'll be buying one of Dan's books, but. <laughs> um, oh, hell yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. His dog thanks <laughs> but, you too. Um, I'm currently <laughs> focusing on creating better user experiences with accessibility um, in my current job right now. However, it's Women's History Month, so on my Instagram, Commute Artists, I'm illustrating wonderful women who have contributed to this country. So that's my fun side project I'm working on for now, so you can check that out. Um, but yeah, I always want input on creating better accessibility for users, so I'm talking to a lot of different people who have disabilities and how I can improve their lives. Fantastic. That's, that's really awesome. So I'll definitely check that out, and I think everyone else should as well. And last but not least, we have John J. Wall, the J because there's a basketball player who uh, also takes that name. So <laughs> John, John J. Wall is much more interesting than the basketball player. But uh, you're at Trust Insights. I don't have a web address for you, but maybe you could give it out and tell us a little bit about what you're doing and what you'd like to promote. Yeah, sure. So trustinsights.ai, we light up dark data. I work with uh, Christopher Penn and Katie Robert over there. And yeah, uh, you know, we don't do ad fraud data, but we could definitely jump into a project like that. Um, but my big plug for this week, the Marketing Over Coffee Playbook is now available over at Amazon. Uh, we've boiled down over a year's worth of podcasts. So we've got guest interviews summarized and all the tech topics and marketing topics in one easy to read volume. So you can check that out at amazon.com. Oh, that's, that's really amazing. Oh, I, I am in awe of that effort. So thank you for doing that. Um, as for me, for more information about me or the show, visit thebeancast.com. There you can find a complete show archive. You can find out how to consult with me, moi, and even how to advertise on the program. So check it all out at thebeancast.com. And now it's time for the Ad Fail 5, a rundown of the lowest moments in advertising, marketing, <laughs> and public relations from the last week. And first up, the same week, the very same week that CEO Mark Zuckerberg doubled down on Facebook's renewed focus on privacy, internal memos were leaked, Jerlin, detailing the efforts of a secretive lobbying group at the company that has for years, I count them, years, worked against <laughs> privacy legislation around the world. This could not have come at a worse time. And it came from a leak, from internally people leak this out into the world. <laughs> When are we ever going to trust these companies and what they're telling us? Fake uh, news. <laughs> oh, man, this is just crazy. Yeah. Well, next up, um, you know how Facebook asks for your phone number, Dan, you know, purely for two-factor <laughs> authentication purposes, you know, no other reason, just want to make sure that we can get you into your account. <laughs> Well, if you gave it to them, the number is now publicly tied to your Facebook data in the site's search. So now if I have your phone number, I can type it in and find everything about you, Dan, from your social platform. <laughs> it connects me and with all is, the information. And that, is and that is why I have never given it to them. I've never given mm -hmm. it to you them can, either. You can, you can find it on the web, I'm sure, but it's not on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Now, next up, Apple tried to ban podcasts from listing episode numbers in their titles. <laughs> this head-scratching move, Rachel, was quickly abandoned for way too many reasons to count. And I know the pun saying count right there at the end. But, you know, this one, it got me. I read this article, I'm like, with horror going, how can we possibly be listing out podcasts without podcast episode numbers? I mean, what is the logic behind that? And then, of course, I get to the end, and it's like Facebook has since retracted this. Yeah, I, I think the immediate question is why, right? You can understand why they want the metadata to read in a way that people can actually understand what they're going to hear. But that was clearly an oversight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it just felt like it was a completely out of left field request. And I, I couldn't believe I was reading that. 
Uh, just in time for International Women's Day last week, Mariner Advertising Watches on Instagram and Twitter advertised with the image of a man grabbing a woman by the neck and pouring whiskey down her throat, Jerlyn, mm. along with oh, the post, great. along with the post, <laughs> like whiskey and a beautiful woman, timepieces demand attention. You gaze first and then indulge. I, you know, it was just the, <sighs> the, the balls of this was just incredible. The, the, the actual willingness to not only put an ad out like that in the current climate, but to put it out on International Women's Month. I mean, it's right, right before International Women's Day, and the entire month is supposed to be dedicated to women. And I have always this. ask who was in the room when this occurred. Well, <laughs> obviously, dudes. <laughs> Wait, Bob, I'm sure you brought it, brought it up if you were in the room. This is a terrible idea. You're not giving yourself enough credit. <laughs> I would have I would have pointed it out. <laughs> you know, another we need some teeth on this stuff though because it is, you know, they do a stunt like this and then like you said the dudes all go by the watches anyways and it dies down. We need need some kind of vengeance of some kind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Except didn't they for an article say that that it's not even maybe a real company? Like there's clearly some translation error occurring there. I don't yeah. know. I, I kind of looked at that. Uh, I, that ad agency spy article was suggesting that maybe the ad was fake, but uh, even the article was kind of halfway on that because you could yeah. still buy watches from this company. So obviously they had something. But I, yeah, I would imagine I it's think... probably a Chinese company and it's just like a lot of translation issues coming across. Mm -hmm. I think there's no question that this one got it horribly, horribly wrong, both in content and in timing. Um, but I do think it'll be an interesting thing as we see people trying to be differentiated and out there and have teeth, to use your word, Dan, in a different context. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is why we saw the safest Super Bowl lineup ever. It's, it's so easy to get it wrong and to offend mm -hmm. in this day and age. I think it'll be interesting to see how, how things go. Yeah. Yeah. And finally, my favorite of the week, because <laughs> I, you know, I don't even know what to say about this, Rachel. Uh, I will, I, wait, I will say one thing. I know this next story because I met the guy and had to look over his work. He actually won second place for an internship at a WPP. So he's on my LinkedIn. <laughs> so you actually know this guy. Well, let me yes. uh, let me let me read the story and then we'll comment on it. A junior art director wanted a job at RGA, that's uh, Robert Greenberg Associates, for those of you who don't know what RGA stands for, so badly he had the agency's name tattooed above his right <laughs> eyebrow. Now, he got the job, Rachel, <laughs> and he better like it because no one else is ever, ever going to hire him. <laughs> uh, Bob, Bob, Bob this, is, this is not impressive because if you remember years ago, there was a New York City agency named Messner, Vetera, Berger, McNamee, Schmetterer, Euro, RSCG. And <laughs> tattoo that on your forehead and that would impress me. I, I get that this is an extreme case, but in the service industry, when talent is one of the hardest challenges we have to solve, to bottle up that kind of enthusiasm and loyalty even before he's even on the team. Man, I mean, it's incredible. No, it's incredible for RGA. RGA's got a really talented art director now who's completely loyal to them, but God forbid he ever gets fired because nobody's ever going to hire this guy because how do you put a guy in front of a client wearing in a competing <laughs> agency's name? I mean, there's also, no way. I'm also curious if this video is actually real. Well, that's what Agency Spy was talking about. They were they were questioning whether or not the video was real and whether or not he's done it, but it kind of feels like, yeah, he did it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> well, the thing is, if I was another agency hiring, I'll just hire, hire him ironically. So <laughs> just have fun. <laughs> Well, good news for him, I guess. Well, have yeah. something to add to this list or just want to discuss it, comment online, use the hashtag AdFail5. That's pound, AdFail, and the number five. Well, that does it for this week's show. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, visit our website at thebeancast.com and click on the subscribe link. If you're an Apple Podcast listener, we've also provided a direct link to our listing there, or just search for The Beancast in the podcast directory on the Apple Podcasts app. And whichever podcast directory you use, whether it's Stitcher or, or Spotify, or Pandora, whatever, when you subscribe, please, please leave us a review. Got a comment? Have a question? We'd love to hear from you. Just send your emails to beancast at gmail.com. Opening theme was performed by Joe Seibel. Closing theme by C. Jax. Thanks for listening. I'm Bob Norp. We'll be back again next week. Hope you'll join us then. It's like, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like
like, like, if it's, you know what I mean? Um, I don't know, man. It's just like, okay, it's like, um, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's totally like that. It's like, uh, it's like, it's like, I don't know, like, if it's, you know, it's like, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's just like, kind of, it just seems like it's just like, almost exactly.